Welcome to The Frequency. I'm your host, Dee Barnes, and thank you for tuning in. All right, we have a special guest for you today. This conversation is going to be so good. It's about the purpose of power. And who do we have? Alicia Garza. You know that name because she is one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we're going to talk about this book and organizing and all kinds of organizations and how do we gain power? And right now on the frequency, welcome Alicia Garza. What's up, sis? Hello, my love. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you. Great to see you too. And thank you for taking the time. I appreciate you. I have to talk to you about your book, The Purpose of Power. But first, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit more. Where did you grow up? You know, I am a Bay Area born and raised homegirl and hand grenade, as they say. Yes. One of my favorites. <laughs> I love that title. Sonia yeah. Sanchez. Yes. Thank right. Giving homage to our sister. That's uh, right. Yeah, I'm born and raised in the Bay Area. I grew up uh, for the first part of my life. Well, all my younger life in uh, Marin County, mm -hmm. uh, which is like north, I think, of uh, San Francisco. It's on the yes. other side of the Golden Gate Bridge, right in between the Golden Gate Bridge and the Richmond Bridge. And then um, I uh, lived in Oakland for okay. about 20 something years until I uh, recently moved uh, to right. the state of Georgia. See, these are rich cultural cities that you're in deep, deep, deep in the community. Definitely. So Definitely. what led you to your path to become an activist? You know, um, I, I would say that my initial kind of 
uh, path here was through my mother. Um, I don't think she, I don't think she meant to do it. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't think she meant to do it, but um, a couple of things. One, my mom used to tell me to look up everything, right? Mm. She, I remember one time she brought me home a t-shirt. My mom loved free stuff. Yes. And she brought me home a t-shirt from uh, the 7-Eleven and it said free Kuwait. And I was like, what's Kuwait? She was like, look it up. And this was like yep. before the internet. <laughs> I was just about to say that my mom did the same thing. She brought those, remember the encyclopedias? Yes, yes. And we that had was a Google. Because she got hers at the garage sale, right? So yes, I was looking it up, like where is Kuwait, and I would learn about the conflict happening there. Mm. Um, but really, there's like an ethos that my mom um, really, I think, embedded in me, which is that everybody deserves to live with dignity. Oh. My mom would say hello to every black person she ever saw anywhere, right. and if I didn't say hello to, she would pop me one, you know, and remind yes. me, you so always got to say what's up to our people. Um, mm -hmm. We live in a world where our people um, are not respected and not even um, acknowledged. And so right. we're going to be a part of that. And also, you know, I'll be honest, my mom for the first part of my life um, was a single mother and mm -hmm. she raised me until I was about four uh, with her twin brother. Uh, and so my mom would work during the day and my uncle would work at night. And my mom talked to me a lot about how hard that was. She talked to me about how child support really didn't cover much right. and you had to fight for every 10 cents of it. And um, she really also talked to me about, you know, the importance of making good decisions with good information, right? She right. did not tell me anything about birds and bees. I never heard stork stories. She was like, oh. <laughs> right. Sex makes babies and babies are expensive. <laughs> right, right. I love that. I love the fact that mothers in particular, especially single moms, they have to. They, they're so truthful. That's they don't right. have time for the fairy tale That's because right. they're so entrenched in the reality. You know what I mean? My mom instilled the same thing into me with, the, with speaking to people. Yeah. Especially speaking to our people. And sometimes because of the world and everything that our people have gone through, there's a there's that shield, that wall, you That's know, right. that defense mechanism. And they're always it's always so um, disarming when you do speak to them. That's right. They're like, oh. Hey, why are you talking to me? Right. Yeah. Why are you talking to me? Or it's like, oh, hey, I guess I'm, it's like, I, I can let the shield down a little bit, you know? That's right. That's right. I have to get into your book now because I feel like that, that was your, your, your upbringing was your path to write this. Am I, am I wrong or am I right? You got it. You right. The purpose of power. I love it. As you can see, I have all my, oh, <laughs> my little stickies in it. It is amazing. I mean, first of all, I'm a, I admire anyone who writes a full book. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? How, I, how, how, what, how did it, how did you get there? Like, how did you, how did you manage to go from beginning to end? You know, it's really funny. I have a few girlfriends right now who are writing books and they're trying to finish and they're in the part of book writing, which I call just being in the tunnel. Yes. <laughs> and you can't, you're like right in the middle of it. You can't see the light at the end and you can't see where you came from. You're just right. And you have to just keep digging and have faith that there's light on the other side. You know, one of the things that um, really inspired me to write this book, um, obviously, was my mother. Mm -hmm. But in addition to her, because my mom always loved my writing and always wanted me to be a writer. Nice. Uh, which, you know, I had to, after she passed away, I didn't think I was going to finish the book. And um, I just knew, like, I, I got to do this for mom. She would be very disappointed if I quit in the middle. But there was also like a political imperative for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were right at the precipice of a major uh, election in this country where we could have uh, made some decisions that were uh, permanent. Right. right. Um, and I'm, of course, referring to the election uh, between Trump and, and Biden. Yes. And really, it's not a party thing. I, I you know, I mean, like many black people, I do. Uh, what I think is in my best interest. <laughs> right, right, of course. I mean, most people do. Right, right, right. But for me, you know, what I was looking at was the the movement perspective. And um, 
you know, there's not a lot of books on organizing. There's a lot of right. things that are retrospective and look back and they're coming from the outside, right? These are people who study people who did the thing. Right. And I think more of us who are actually doing the thing need to write. My book is not the definitive book on organizing, but it was meant to spark a conversation amongst other organizers and people who are trying to create change mm -hmm. about what we think it takes and what we're doing it for. This work right. is really hard. If you don't have clarity about what you're trying to get out of it, yes. <laughs> then you're not going to be in it for very long. Mm -hmm. I also really wanted to put at the forefront, sister, that um, power is actually what we're fighting for. Mm. Um, and that is really different than I think a lot of the ways that we talk to each other as Black people, especially about what it is that we want. Um, right. I think we're taught in some ways that what we want is the is like white people's version of the thing, but make it Black. And I'm like, I'm not sure. I think we want the ability to make decisions for ourselves. And I think we want the ability um, to create systems that don't that don't actually result in inequity and poverty and pain. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to do that, we actually have to consider what does that take? It's not just empowerment, right? We get we talk we talk to each other and we get talked to a lot about feeling good about ourselves in the midst of conditions that are terrible, yes. rather than changing the conditions themselves so that you actually can feel good and be doing good at the same time. Right, right. That's really what I'm trying to put on the table with the purpose of power. This is this is, this is amazing. Um, I'm so grateful we're having this conversation because there's so much I wanna ask you. Uh, first, I wanna break down what you said about movement. And it's something you said that was so profound in the book. You said that um, hashtags do not start movements, people do. That's right. And I was like, hello, because this generation is all about the hashtag. So can you break down what you meant by that? Yeah, well, you know, I've come to start saying that over the last decade because, um, you know, with the rise of Black Lives Matter, uh, I think the most common question that I would hear, uh, you know, besides, you know, don't all lives matter, which. Right. You know, yes. Right? But the most common question that I would hear is, um, well, how did you start a movement from a hashtag? And I was like, I don't, un I don't understand. That's not mm -hmm. what happened here. Right. Um, one, these movements are old, right? And mm -hmm. um, they ebb and flow, right? I didn't start, and I didn't start a movement. I started an organization with my sisters uh, that is in the Black radical tradition, right? Right. And we didn't create that, right? Our people created that. Um, uh, you know, through a, a, a unspeakable conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and it came before us. And if we do our jobs right, it'll come after us too. Um, but we'll be winning things that have us uh, able to fight for for other things, right? right? We can have new problems to solve instead of trying to keep chipping away at these old and The ones. same problems. You know how <laughs> I mean, the same problems the generation before us had. And it right. reminds me so much of James Baldwin. Exactly. You know, when... <laughs> Exactly. How long do we have to wait for the progress? How long must we wait? How long must we wait for the progress? I, I'm just, as yeah. you say that, that you're chipping away at something that, and I, that we're still dealing with. We're still we're dealing still. with it. Okay, listen, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to go more into what we're still dealing with right here on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Back right here on the frequency with Alicia Garza, and we are talking about the, the movements and the movement that we're in right now, and the battles that we're fighting 
yeah, as African Americans are still fighting to this day that we seem to have been fighting for generations. Alicia, welcome back. When when you said that, like I was just telling you, I'm it made me want to laugh and cry at the same time because why do you think that the progress is taking so long? We've 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 sent out this message over and over again. What is it gonna take? Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, it's got to take a couple of things. Yes. Uh, and what I'm going to say, Sister D, you're going to understand uh, deeply. Um, one, I think it takes power. Mm. So we need to be making the rules. Uh, we need to be the people who are setting the agenda. Um, and we need to have an agenda um, that is not uh, just focused on a small group of people, but like, does the best for the most amount of people. Right. Um, so that's one piece. But then there's an internal piece that I really, you know, have been thinking about a ton. As a student of history, um, I know that um, all successful movements are interrupted, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're often interrupted by outside um, influences, but they use um, members of our communities right? Mm -hmm. um, to kind of create strife and, um, you know, discord and disharmony. And, you know, it's interesting because when you look throughout history at every successful movement, right, right, that has been an element. And the result of it, of course, is that our, um, our perspective on what it will take is that nothing can change anything. Right. It leads mm. to nihilism. It leads to apathy. Um, we come to think of ourselves as inherently flawed people that can't get anything right. Yeah. And um, I think we have to really develop and design tools to protect against that, uh, especially in a culture where uh, we are now bombarded with so much information that we don't know where it comes from. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Before we can fact check. Yeah, we just absorb it. We just absorb it. We just absorb it. Like, how long did it take for me to learn your story and your history, sister? Right. Right. How long has it taken for people to understand uh, that this movement is not hashtag fueled, but organizer fueled? Exactly. Um, how long has it taken for people to really understand, you know, and what Dr. King was trying to do and what Malcolm X was trying to accomplish, what Sister Rosa was trying to accomplish, right. and even what this movement is trying to accomplish and what has gotten in the way of that. I talk about this in the book about, uh, 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 you know, the stories that we tell that are, I call fairy tales, that right. we perpetuate, that make us feel better, but confuse us about how change happens and what gets in the way. Um, and I, I, I don't subscribe to the notion that um, we're our own worst enemies, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't do that. Okay. But what I will say is, um, if we really about this life, <laughs> we really about this life, um, then we have to be committed to um, uh, a more nuanced understanding, not just of um, human fallacy, right? right. The real thing. Uh, but we also have to be really deeply entrenched in the strategies that white supremacy and this government has used to keep itself intact. Mm. Um, and we have to ha hold both of those things together and right. then and then make assessments right about what we're working with and how it is that we move forward. Whew. You know, one of the things that. Um, each of these movements within the community, I've always, you know, admired and try to get involved with, mm -hmm. but I never understood the process of an organizer mm -hmm. and how do you organize? Yeah. Can you please break that down for the audience? Because I know there's people out there that are like, I want to do something. I feel like I need to do something, but they don't know where to begin. They don't know how the process start. And I'm one of those people. So please yeah. walk me through it because I really want to know, you know, I've been part of, um, for example, with hip hop, we were part of this process, the All in the Same Gang Project, yeah. which was to stop gang violence. And I was all in from the music yeah. part to the, um, you know, we had these giveaways and of course, corporate sponsorship got involved and, you know, then it becomes a another thing. And then we went to the, you know, the certain um, 
heavily, heavily gang influenced area in Los Angeles. And we did the video and we, we helped the community and then <coughs> packed up and left. Mm -hmm. And then I'd never seen them go back to do it. And I felt like that was something that I should have made, you know, picked up the mantle to continue or how. So can you please Walk me through, like, how do you become an organizer and what are the steps to that it takes to to create and maintain? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm so glad you told that story, Sister D, because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think where and who you work with is just as important as what you do. Oof. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, you were you are giving yeah. us some truth bombs today. Go ahead. Go well, ahead. I, I often say, you know, it's important to figure out what you care about mm. and to find other people who care about the same things that you do. Right. Um, but it's also important to to understand um, or to even consider, right? Um, what's important to me about how the work gets done and who I'm working with. Um, and I often find that people don't do that extra layer, right? And so then they get really deeply disappointed when they encounter um, something like what you encountered, right? Which right. was um, a misalignment, right? Of, of goals and outcomes, okay? Yes. Um, and so, you know, there are so many incredible organizations out there who um, prioritize and really live their values around, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, participation, mm -hmm. right? And engagement, direct engagement, and really being led by people who are being impacted by the problems that you're trying to solve. Right. Um, people who are more relationship focused and based rather than, um, not rather than, but there's lots of different ways to approach change, right? Okay. You can, um, you know, give stuff away, right? That's a way yeah. to approach change. Right. And you can also give people the tools that they need to be the change makers themselves. Exactly. So whatever your approach is, find a group that shares your approach, not just the same thing you care about. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I would say uh, is that organizing is fundamentally about building relationships among people who don't currently know each other, who care about the same things and want to take action together. And so to be an organizer, um, you really uh, need to first and foremost be somebody who can do good listening, right. um, somebody who is also themselves willing to share, uh, you know, your vision, your hopes, your fears, right? right. Um, and then also someone who uh, is thinking about over time, um, how do we think we solve this problem, okay? Right. And I think with organizing, we have this idea, right? That there's one person. This is an example of those yeah. fairy tales. We've get, we can all name, you know, a leader of a movement, but can we name the engine behind it, right? Like, do people talk about Diane Nash? Do people talk about uh, the fact that Sister Rosa continued to organize well into her um, 80s, right? <laughs> wow, they don't. They don't. Like literally, and it's because we don't know that, right? We're taught that you know, for you to be an organizer, you have to be the one with the bullhorn, you gotta be the one in front. And that's not what organizing is. Mm -hmm. Organizing is reaching as many people as possible who are looking for you <laughs> mm -hmm. and getting people together to come up with solutions to the challenges that we face. Um, and what's core to that at the very, very center of it is being able to build relationships among people who might want the same thing, but they might come from different places. How do you build bridges amongst people's differences in order for us to take action together? Not get rid of the differences. The differences are not a bad thing. It's right. Just, how do you bring all those different elements together so that it becomes a song? Okay. Hmm. Really what an organizer is. Is this something that you've always wanted to be when you were growing up? Like, I can't see you as a little child, even though you were raised in Oakland. Mm -hmm. So you had like the Black Panther, you know, influence, yeah. community yeah. based influence on you. But was that something that you wanted to do when you were like younger? You were like, this is what I want to do, maybe politics or something community. You know, it's so funny. I didn't know what organizing really was until I got to college. Um, right. And, you know, we should we, we got to think about that. Right. Again, I didn't learn about organizing in middle school or high no, school. Right. Not. And that was designed. And we can see in places like Florida, mm -hmm. um, 
places like Alabama, right? They're trying to like reinstate that kind of stuff. Places yes. like Texas where, you know, they have textbooks that say that there was no slavery. Right? Right. Actually, slavery was was people migrating from Africa to come here to work. That's right. literally what they're teaching in schools, right? Insane. So, That's insanity. It's bizarre. So I, I didn't grow up learning and knowing about organizing. And then on top of that, Sister D, um, you know, growing up in the 80s and uh, early 90s, I will say that, um, you know, at that point, uh, the Panthers were not at their height anymore. And so right. the way that people talked about that work was quite different. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until I got to college and got exposed to texts and people, right? Right, right. <laughs> work that I was like, I can do that. I'm social. You know, I like to build relationships, but fundamentally, I'm a connector. Um, and that I think is uh, my role, right? right. Um, what I'm good at. I'm good at bringing people together who don't think they have anything in common to like get stuff done together. And so- you, know, you really shocked me there for a minute thinking about your upbringing in Oakland. It's, they're not teaching what the no. Panthers did in school. It's no. silence. It's no. almost, I mean, not at all. Like Nothing. not at all. But what's cool is as an adult, I can tell you, um, Panthers are everywhere. Like I right. remember Panthers at the grocery store, at the doctor's office. You know, when you go out to eat, it's like, Folks are still very much alive, very much active. A lot of the programs that people began are still in existence and still taking care of our people. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So some of it is like um, uh, uh, being able to also expose people, right, mm -hmm. to what's right. in front of their face. That is also a part of organizing, right? Like we're mm -hmm. all taught to see the world a certain way, and the way we're taught to see the world benefits a certain group of people and benefits a certain arrangement. Right. Um, and as an organizer, right, your role is often to expose people to um, um, different perspectives, right, and different ways of, of looking at things and um, to really also expose how power operates, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't until somebody organized me, right, that I understood, oh, not only was I not taught this stuff, Wow. Right? That there was actually an agenda behind not teaching me these things. Mm. Then I became committed to finding out more, right? Exactly. More. I feel like this is what people are doing now on YouTube, but they're going down weird, like rabbit holes that, yes. you know, may not take you into a good place. Yeah. <laughs> so Radicalizing people in, a, in a different, different directions. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to get into our favorite chapters the purpose of power right here with Alicia Garza on the frequency on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Right here on the frequency, with Alicia Garza, and we are talking about her book, The Purpose of Power. Alicia, please join me. Um, how we come together when we fall apart, which I thought was, wow, interesting. I wanna get into that, but I wanna share something with you because the reason I was asking you about organizing too was also I had an experience with um, Diane Watson, Senator Diane Watson, when the whole uh, Los Angeles riots happened. And this is when I was still doing um, the hip hop show, Pump It Up. We went into the community and we watched her work. And it was amazing because, you know, everything got burned down and they were like, they needed stuff like simple things like diapers, yeah. baby formula. And she had all these, you know, organizations that were coming in and donating stuff. And then she was organizing it and having people, you know, get it out to the community. And it was amazing to see. She was the, the front face like you were talking about, but then she had all these people behind her 
that were doing it. And as I was, you know, speaking to her, just like I'm speaking to you, I was in awe because I was like, how does she do it? How is it being done? And I feel like your book, definitely for me, got to keep showing it because I, I love it. I'm going to give it out to a couple of people as gifts because like, um, it's a textbook on how to, how to, how to get it started. Mm -hmm. And when you say how we come together, when we fall apart, it made me think about that moment in the Los Angeles riots where everything fell apart and mm -hmm. then they, now we have to rebuild. Yeah. So what are you, some of your favorite chapters in the book? Oh, I have so many favorites. Oh, and, okay. And, okay. You know, it's funny because, um, in writing the book, I really, I, I don't think I did as much editing as I would have done if, if I had allowed myself to like think about it, right? Right. <laughs> that I felt like just needed to be talked about mm -hmm. that I, I felt like could be controversial, but shouldn't be, right? Like these right. are, again, um, in the same way that, right, like SNCC had all these debates about, you know, do we register people to vote? Or do we train people how to do direct action, right? Right, right. I feel like there are a series of debates that we need to have um, as a generation and figure out where we land, where we land uh, in terms of what, what, how do we think we win in this moment? How do we think we come together when everything is very clearly disintegrating? Um, one of my favorite chapters in this book is pedestals, profiles, and platforms. Um, and you know, it, it's a, it's a piece of the book where I really talk about um, how for the first time in my lifetime, you know, activists really um, got celebritized, right? Yes. We just, this is not a thing that I had ever seen. I've been organizing for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the more public and visible way uh, that I'm known, I think, um, doesn't capture right how long I've been in this work. <laughs> right, it doesn't. It doesn't. I, I just want to say like this has not happened before in my lifetime, where you know you have uh, activists walking red carpets, and you know, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to be named as like Times Most Influential People of the Year. Like this is not a thing that happens, and. Right. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that people approach it. Some people have a real disdain for it and feel mm -hmm. like it's opportunistic or it's somehow shady. You know, other people come into this work because that's what they want. Right. Um, so we're kind of in that era now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I really make this argument that I, it's not that it's inherently good or bad. It's that you have to have clear strategy on what you're using it for. If you're using it just to boost your own personal um, um, profile, profile, right? Mm -hmm. That's not actually moving us forward as a community, right. but you're using those um, that that level of exposure to also expose people to the issues uh, and concerns and demands of your community. Um, then that's a whole other conversation, uh, you know, altogether. I also kind of talk a little bit about the gender disparities, right? Of like mm -hmm. who gets highlighted and who doesn't, and why. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I talked a lot about, you know, how, uh, you know, often it's it's men, right? Cis exactly. Gender, heterosexual men that get placed at the forefront. I, I remember seeing this cover, I think, of like Vanity Fair that made me want to like pluck my eyeballs out, right? Mm -hmm. Not because I don't love me some Tracy because I love her. Right. Love Tracy. <laughs> um, but because it was like they were doing this like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X themed thing with like the woman in the background, but that's like not what was happening. Right. <laughs> and actually what has been so um, powerful, I think about this last decade is that we've really seen the increase of public visible leadership from women, from queer people, from trans people. Right. right. And, and I think that that is, uh, uh, deeply important. And yet we had these kind of mainstream um, um, narratives, right, that we're still holding on to about the powerful man and the strong woman behind him. Hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, we talk about that in that chapter. Um, another chapter that I'm really, uh, that's relative to that is this chapter on imposter syndrome. 
Um, oh man, like, you're oh, hitting the truth bomb. Because I've been, I've been feeling that lately. I have been, I have been in it. Yeah, it's my love letter to us, honestly. Um, and I talk about right how it's not so much that we, you know, there may be some piece of imposter syndrome for Black women and women of color where we feel like we don't have the appropriate skills or we're just not good enough, right? But also right. patriarchy is a real thing. And, you know, living in a world where men get to be mediocre. <laughs> okay. The, the, I'm talking people. the bare minimum. Like just, just nothing. Literally. Just on a t-shirt, don't brush their teeth. No, and the audacity <laughs> of it all, right? The <laughs> audacity of it all. And like, but like we live in a world where we have to navigate you know, when we say something, people look at us funny, but when a man says the same thing less skillfully than we did, right? Right. Then everybody flocks towards what they said, even though it was your idea. Exactly. Um, and so I, I want to highlight that because I think there are still... And when we lot- say it as women, excuse me, when we say it as women, we get picked apart. Totally. And but- that's on so many levels, right? right. Whether it's you know, telling our stories, right, of how we've been done wrong, Mm -hmm. whether it's giving our ideas for how it is that we move forward. Right. Um, Our ideas are less, are considered to be less valid um, um, than that of people who um, occupy positions of power in our society. And we still have to talk about it. Um, And so I really wanted to put that chapter in there because I wanted people to understand that just because we're fighting for a world where there's justice and right. freedom and liberation doesn't mean that we're not still intentionally or unintentionally mm-hmm. perpetuating the same dynamics that we're trying to intervene on. Right. Um, so I put it in there so that we could really think about like in our organizations and the work that we do and the efforts that we put forth, mm-hmm. are we still doing the same stuff, you know, yeah. or are we being conscious about not just representation, right? But representation right. with substance, okay? I don't just want more women in decision-making roles, but I want more women who have the same values that I do in right. decision-making roles. Um, That's so- what made me feel like um, your chapter on the power of identity politics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was one of the ones that I was thinking about because just that word, mm-hmm. identity, can you break it down for the audience so they... Well, yeah, that word comes from us. I mean, identity politics is actually a a, a movement phrase that comes first through the uh, Kambahi River Collective and people like Barbara Smith, right, Mm. Um, who talked about how they cannot separate their politics, right, from who they are in the world. Right. Um, Then um, it gets co-opted, right? It gets co-opted by conservatives in this country who use it as a pejorative term. Identity politics goes from um, how you reconcile, right? Um, uh, being of color, being woman, your sexuality, right? In a right. world that doesn't want you to um, survive because of that, to, uh, you know, woke whining, right? No, no, you did not wait. You done said the buzzword. No, no, you didn't. I did. The woke. I did. The woke. Then, what what do you think about that? Like how no. they're taking the word. And I think it's complicated because honestly, what happens is we start to adopt the same stuff. So right. then you start hearing black people be, I'm not into that identity politics stuff. What is you talking about? You don't have a choice. Exactly. You have a choice. If you are aware of the fact that you are black in this country, you do not get to abhor identity politics. And just right. because some white man in a suit told you it was wrong doesn't mean you have to adopt that. That comes from our foremothers. You understand right. I me? Mean, that yeah. was the way for us to... Um, wrap ourselves in bubble wrap, right? <laughs> they, um, we got to outlast this idea um, that we have to leave parts of ourselves behind in order to pursue justice and freedom. Mm. Um, and so I put that in the book because I needed people to understand some of these really tricky methods um, that conservatives in particular use to create and stow division and confusion amongst our own ranks. Um, you know, you have us talking about us against us, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. we don't understand the origins of where those things come from. And we don't understand always um, the impacts, right, of adopting those narratives. Um, we don't need to be microphones for, um, my mom used to say, for example, the devil don't need no help. 
Mm. Okay. Yep. So people, I'm just being a devil's advocate. She would be like, the devil don't need no help. They're doing fine on their own. Mm. Conservatives don't need help in terms of getting their message out. We shouldn't, um, you know, keep kicking around their language, trying to draw people's attention to it because all it's doing is embedding it. Right. right? Right. Um, what we do have to do, though, is organize our people, make sure our people are equipped with the information that we need um, to be critical thinkers mm. right, and to see through the nonsense and also to see what's on the other side. Um, right. That's 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 why I wrote. That's that. what I want to get into next. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk to Alicia about how, how do we get to the other side and, and acquiring that power right here on the frequency on the Black Star Network. talk about blackness and what happens in black culture we're about covering these things that matter to us uh, speaking to our issues and concerns this is a genuine people-powered movement There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting you get it and you spread the word we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us we cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it this is about uh, covering us invest in black owned media your dollars matter we don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff so please support us in what we do folks we want to hit two thousand people fifty dollars this month raise a hundred thousand dollars we're behind a hundred thousand so we want to hit that your money makes this possible check some money orders go to PO box five seven one nine six washington dc two zero zero three seven dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Back right here in the frequency with uh, Alicia Garza. We're talking about our book, The Purpose of Power. Alicia, please join me because I want to talk about what you were saying, how we get to the other side and, you know, power. Like, how do we get the power? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but how do we get power? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, we got to organize. We got to pass laws and we got to put people in positions that can help us. That's 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 basically it. That's, that's basically big. it. That's and big. I think that's important because I think a lot of people um, haven't fully thought about how power works mm-hmm. and also how we get it. Right. right. And so I hear people all the time being like, we should just boycott or we should just not participate. And I'm like, OK, I hear you. Mm-hmm. But here's the challenge with that. It makes you feel good. Right. right? <laughs> it definitely makes you feel good. But the machine continues without you and it makes laws about you and it makes laws without you. And so if you're abstaining, um, you know, from moral objection, I get it. Mm -hmm. I get it. But like, who stops the machine? Are you thinking about getting into politics, like running for any type of office? Mm. You know, when I was in Oakland, I thought about it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're a tight knit community there and we've got some of the best people to do it coming out of our state. Right. Um, I am really excited to support, uh, you know, one of my mentors and she rose Congresswoman Barbara Lee for Senate. Yes. Uh, And she will be the only black woman in the U S Senate if she is elected and the Mm -hmm. only black woman for sure with our values. So, um, big shout out to, um, to, uh, a Congresswoman Lee. Yes. And um, we'll be working, you know, to make sure that uh, her race is successful. And then also my sister, Latifah Simon, um, who is a warrior and has oh, been yes. a warrior since she was like 16 years old, right? Like people wow. don't know that Latifah, um, I believe, is the youngest person, one of the youngest people to win a MacArthur Genius Award. Mm. I mean, like people, Latifa has been helping to like run the BART transit system for the right. last 10 years and killing it and has brought in more money than any of her predecessors to help see, improve the system. I wouldn't have known about her until you tweeted about her. That's That's what I'm, I'm obsessed with her and she happens to be my friend. 
But one of the reasons that I'm obsessed with her is that Latifa does all this stuff, right? And she just moves how she moves. She doesn't do it for the accolades, right? She just moves how she moves, like, you know, putting community ambassadors on BART instead of police officers, right? Like she, knows, she knows what's up. So uh, she is running for Congresswoman Lee's seat. And so this site next this time next year we could be putting two black women from california wow. uh, into the united states congress which i'm 100 percent for and yes. i um would just I love agree. to work for and behind them that would make okay. me so happy that that's how you that's how you get involved you're working your as a support system i see you yeah. i see you as like the help in the foundation you know <laughs> so, so what is black um what is it black lab black future black lab excuse lab. me what is that? This is, is that your organization? Is that something you started? Yeah. So uh, in 2017, I left Black Lives Matter um, because I really wanted to start an organization that was focused on building power with elections. Right. And, um, this has been an age old debate in our movements about whether or not to participate in elections. Um, obviously, we know that there is a ton of corruption inside of government and government does not function the way that we want it to. But yeah. I am also a deep believer that like um, we cannot leave these folks up to their own devices. Right. <laughs> um, there's too much at stake and there's too much uh, online for us to just walk away from it. It's ours just as much as it's theirs. Right. Uh, if not more so. Right. And so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I built the Black Futures Lab in order to work to make Black communities powerful in politics so we could be powerful in the rest of our lives. When we right. think about issues of police violence, when we think about issues of public safety, when we think about issues of affordable housing or jobs or wages, um, all of these things are decided through policy, not through wishing and hoping that things would be different. That's right. Um, and uh, too often, right, mm -hmm. Black folks are not, not only not at the table, um, but we're not even shaping the agenda of what's being discussed. Right. And um, our work aims to change that. So we do uh, uh, build independent black political power from uh, with a range of strategies that includes collecting recent and relevant data about who we are and what we care about. Um, we have run and conducted the largest survey of black people in American history with our mm. Black Census Project. Uh, and we, uh, it's open right now for people to participate. So you can take it at blackcensus.org. Nice. Uh, you don't have to be, you know, political. It's a nonpartisan survey. You don't have to give us your contact information or your name or anything like that to take the survey. We just want to know what you deal with, what you think is important and what you want to see done about it. And then we take that data and we do something called the Black Agenda. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be doing that for 2024, which is taking that information and turning it into a legislative agenda of policies that we fight for together right. in cities and states to make a real change in our neighborhoods. <coughs> we also um, do door-to-door -door organizing and we mm. educate, activate, and motivate Black people to participate. Um, uh, and not because our ancestors died for the right or anything like that, just right. so we can be powerful, right? Exactly. Um, it's us that are putting uh, these issues on the map mm -hmm. uh, and it's important for us to participate so that we can maintain and build our power. Um, so right. that's something that we work on. Uh, and then we tell new and different stories about who black people are and who we can be. We are bombarded every single day by narratives yes tell us we're not enough, that we don't do enough, that we don't do the right thing. And the fact of the matter is more of us do the right thing than the wrong thing or nothing at all. Um, exactly. and so we want to put those stories out there and we do that, you know, in a number of different ways. If you want to learn more about the Black Futures Lab, you can visit us at blackfutureslab.org. And of course, if you want to take the Black Census, take it at blackcensus.org and then pass it to like five of your friends. That's right. That's amazing. I have to ask you, you know, um, you said that in 2017, you left Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Because you were one of the original founders of the organization. Mm -hmm. What led you to that decision? Yeah. Um, look, I've always been an organizer at heart, and I feel very strongly that 
um, there are multiple ways to make change. Um, for me, I, I don't think it makes sense for all of us to be concentrated in one lane, right? right. You need many approaches, many perspectives. Uh, and for me, I felt like, look, like, it's no shade to any way that anybody else wants to do a thing, but where my heart is and where my passion is, is making sure that we pass laws that change the lives of black people. Right. Um, and so, you know, I start, I decided to start something myself that could help contribute right to this mm -hmm. bigger uh, approach and strategy. Um, with that being said, you know, I'm very grateful to be like the smallest part of something that has, um, literally changed the course of history. It really has. It really has. And I have to tell you, thank you. Thank you for doing that, you and your sisters, because that has really, um, I think it has helped a lot of people, Black people, mm -hmm. just have an umbrella to come underneath to, to connect. And not just Black people. I mean, it connected all people. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really a movement, a force of change. Do you still feel like it is? a movement and a force of change? I do. I feel like it's it's been quite beat up. <laughs> right. so, um, you know, but I, I do. I do think that, um, you know, people are thinking about race in this country in a whole different way. And we're also thinking differently about what's possible. Um, and so, again, I'm grateful to be the smallest part of something um, that has had such a major impact. Um, and I look forward, you know, years from now uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, um, you know, continuing to correct the record. Uh, right. About, uh, the work that has been done and the work that is being done. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, as a student of history, I um, look at things with a lot of nuance. Yes. Right? And um, I am aware, right, that, um, that this movement has had such a global impact Right. And that it has a bullseye on its um, on it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't take that lightly. Right. Has it been a bullseye on you? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, in 2020, right, actually the day that my book came out, um, I was visited at my home by the FBI. They said that my name yes. um, was on a hit list uh, wow. with several other elected officials and, you know, um, other activists. And uh, yeah, the FBI came to my house, give me a duty to warn, which is basically like, they just tell you some <laughs> heads up, but you on your own. Yeah, but we can't do anything about it. And you should just be really careful type stuff. <laughs> what? Um, but interestingly, next month, um, so the people were caught. And it Good. was actually not just one person, it was like nine or 10 people that were part of a Aryan nation cell. Oh my um, God. They had planned to blow up power grids and, you know, kill a bunch of people. And they're actually going on trial um, pretty soon in North Carolina. So, um, you know, racial safe? violence and racial terror is still very much a, a, a tactic that is used to stop and dis, dis, disrupt. disband and disrupt. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How do you feel now about your safety? I feel okay. Good. You know, um, you know, I was always taught that, um, you know, whenever there are threats made upon you, you're not supposed to be secret about it. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to tell people, you're supposed to tell a lot of people because exactly. you want to work it out for you and making sure that they know That's if something right. is out of the ordinary. And so right. um, uh, I, I feel good and I feel, I certainly feel embraced and protected. Good, because we want you to be embraced and protected. Mm, I appreciate that. Of course, sis. And what's in the future for you? What's next? You know, I'm like coming off of this midterm election. We just got our numbers back about how we did door knocking in North Carolina and California and Georgia and Wisconsin. And I'm really happy to say that through our work at the Black to the Future Action Fund, which is like kind of like our uh, uh, an affiliated organization. Right. Um, we talked to black people who may or may not have voted in the last for election cycles, mm. right? Usually folks that get targeted for door knocking are people who, you know, vote all the time. <laughs> right. Focused on people who are like, I'm not sure if I'm going to vote or not, right? I but vote sometimes, back in. other times. And because of our work, Sister D, 
um, we increased voter turnout by 50% amongst people who uh, voted infrequently uh, since 2018. So mm -hmm. that's a big deal to me, especially as it relates to black folk. Yes. So I'm going to keep doing that. We're still working on the black census. We're trying to get to 200,000 responses mm -hmm. and we're about halfway there. Again, we are like shattering records for, um, uh, 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 collecting data on black people. This literally is the largest survey of black people in the history of this country. Right. And you can be a part of that. So I'm um, um, just doing that. And then also um, have some creative projects on deck that I hope are able to get off the ground. Yeah. And get off the ground. But um, oh. you know, we'll tell more when it's, when it's kind of on the way. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for sharing your time with us. This has been an amazing yeah. conversation. I have to tell everyone, Please read this book, The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. It is amazing. Um, I'm giving it out to several people. I want my daughters to read it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's important. And I hope that it'll inspire me to take the mantle and do something on that level. You're already doing Never it. be on your level, but you know, close, close and supporting it. Um, already doing it. So thank you, sister. I really appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. And you stay safe. We love you. We thank love you. So you. We appreciate you. Thank okay. you. You're back. Okay, good, good. Big hugs and much love. Thank you Big for having me. Luck. Thank you. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Another episode of The Frequency with this book right here, The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart by Alicia Garza. I want to thank her so much for the truth bombs that she let off today. She really helped us understand the meaning of the movement, um, Black Lives Matter, and all the things we talked about, you know, discussing politics. And I hope that, you know, Everyone out there enjoyed this conversation and that you take something from it where you might go into your own community and start a movement, an organization. Remember, it doesn't start from hashtags, it starts from people. Thank you, I'll catch you next time.